May we also say, come, Lord Jesus, and say it with our hearts, our lips, and our lives. Amen. I don't know if that is... Do we need to take care of something? Oh. I want to share with you a poem written this week called Hymn for the Hurting. Everything hurts. Our hearts shadowed and strange, minds made muddied and mute. We carry tragedy, terrifying and true, and yet none of it is new. We knew it as home, as horror, as heritage, even as our children cannot be children, cannot be. Everything hurts. It's a hard time to be alive and an even harder time to stay that way. We are burdened to live out these days while at the same time blessed to outlive them. This alarm is how we know we must be altered, that we must differ or die, that we must triumph or try. Thus, while hate cannot be terminated, it can be transformed into a love that lets us live. May we not just grieve, but give. May we not just ache, but act. May our signed right to bear arms never blind our sight from shared harm. May we choose our children over chaos. May another innocent never be lost. Maybe everything hurts, our hearts shadowed and strange. But only when everything hurts, may everything change. This is by poet Amanda Gorman. It's a piece that almost wasn't written because she found it so hard to find the words to write poetry about horrific, unintelligible tragedy, she said. In such times, we all struggle to find words to pray, words to address God when we're dumbstruck by tragedy, grief, shock, misguided human cruelty. Paul and Silas were taken to the magistrates for ruining the means of money-making for owners of a slave who could tell fortunes. They accused them of disturbing the city. They were stripped of their clothing, beaten with rods, put into the deepest cell, and their feet placed in stocks. What else is there to do in such desperate circumstances but pray and sing hymns to God. And we're told the other prisoners listened. Five days ago, we had the 27th K through 12 school shooting in 2020 so far. We aren't even halfway through the year. Those 27 shooting events are included in the total of 212 mass shootings since January. That's not the number of people, that's the number of events, incidents. If you count up the people, it is, 100 and, it is 807 who were injured and another 242 who have died. Today, like Paul and Silas, we too are praying and singing hymns to God because it's part of our faith. It's part of our response to God, calling out in prayer our grief and brokenhearted shock, our rage and frustration, our deep, deep hope given us by Christ Jesus.
I found myself offended and really kind of fuming at reading so many cynical comments dismissive of prayer, eschewing it for not being an action or not making a difference when so much is wrong. Their legs in shackles, in a locked prison cell, Paul and Silas sang and prayed, showing their faith and calm to those in prison with them, including the jailer, it seems. Their prayer was an action. After the earthquake broke open the stocks and cells, they continued to act, not by jumping up and leaving, but by staying put, letting God work with what was. They showed compassion and mercy even to the jailer who stood ready to kill himself out of shame and fear by reassuring him that they were all still there. None of these occasions for sharing or showing their faith was planned. They were spontaneous, some might say accidental. Or was there more to it? As we read through the book of Acts, as we have been reading these months, we see that Luke repeatedly leads us to consider God's visitations, God's self-revealing, le- <clears throat> are enabled by just such human experiences, situations. That's not to suggest God causes disaster, pain, trauma to make a dramatic entrance, nor that the presence of God in such times is part of a grand chess master plan. Their response in that difficult moment was to sing and pray. And I tried to imagine that. As I was writing last night, I kept trying to find words to suggest, well, most of us wouldn't react that way, right? But I kept thinking, you probably would. And I hope I would too. It seems a perfectly reasonable response and a faithful one. I hope we all would because God can use each of us whenever and wherever we are and it is best done in partnership. God sets about healing and shaping a better world by holding us in his hands as if we are the finest tools. We're co-creators by listening and being ready to bring our gifts to bear when called, even if it looks accidental. On Wednesday night, David Reed, the Episcopal Bishop of West Texas, said, we must pray, ignore the cynics, pray with all your heart, let your cries reach to the heavens, let your anger and despair be your prayer, and listen to God answering in return. Look for God's tears revealed and listen for his perfect and righteous anger. Give yourself over to opportunities to join in the Spirit's work of binding up and healing. Love with all you've got and never, ever surrender to the darkness. Because, he writes, because I believe in Jesus, I am convinced that sin and death are defeated and will never prevail over the light of resurrection. Because I believe in eternal life. I trust that the senseless murder of these innocent children is not the final thing to be said about them. If the gospel is true, it is true in all times and in all places, including in Uvalde. As I sat with this this week, considered, thought about the children, the teachers, the staff, families, of the Uvalde school and the other 26 shootings since January, I can only imagine the impossible pain of the families losing a child. Sadly, several of us, several people at St. Michael's have had a child die. And no matter how young or old they were or how it happened, those who did You know those feelings firsthand in a way no one else can. No one but God. 
If you're one of them, help others understand how to live and breathe in such unconscionable loss. Help those who must continue walking into schools daily. Help us figure out how a human being can love so deeply and also be filled with so much pain, rage, emptiness. Help by sharing your faith and how it brings you here to pray and sing hymns and to act through them incompatible with pain as it may seem. Brother Curtis of the Society of St. John the Evangelist wrote about joy last week, calling it a melding of delight and gratitude, freedom and hope. Joy goes without saying when the burdens of life are lifted, when the flow of life turns into a beautiful harmony or a consoling fragrance, he wrote. Yes, joy goes without saying when everything is going well and it seems life is good, the sun is shining, the birds sing, and the buds bloom. This type of joy is real and yet short-lived. We saw it change with horrible speed when those happy last days of school gave way to tragedy in Uvalde. And that's where joy is such a paradox. Paul and Silas move from walking free, proclaiming, healing a young woman of a dark spirit, to being stripped, beaten, and imprisoned. Paul writes repeatedly of Jesus' teaching about joy in the context of suffering. One poet spoke of that pain and suffering as carving out a chasm for joy in our souls. Brother Curtis says, this is not to say we should go looking for suffering. No need. Suffering will find us. It visits us, as does joy. We need not wait to earn it or afford it. It doesn't wait for all to be right with the world or for us to be old enough or smart enough to appreciate it. God gives it freely. And we who are already broken open by pain and suffering, may we also be thus open to holding great joy. When Jesus prays for his disciples, we hear his great love for them, his abiding trust in God. He prays first for them, and then in the same breath, also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their words. It doesn't end with them, or we wouldn't be here. And it doesn't end with us. Finally, he prays for a unity that we can scarcely imagine these days, that they may be one as Jesus and the Father are one. He isn't speaking of being in agreement, like-mindedness in all things, rather that they enter into a unity in which they know they are loved by God the way God loves Jesus, that no matter what our differences, we may be one by virtue of being beloved of God. This may be the only way we are all the same. We are all beloved by God. And it is certainly the hardest thing for us to grasp, act on, believe, for them and now for us. We think we're defined by our differences. It's the biggest argument the early church wrestled with. Who can be one of them and who cannot be? Jewish first or not? Circumcised or not? Are Gentiles who follow Christ's way less part of the whole? Are they less legitimate? Did Jesus really come for us and for them? But when the weapons are turned on each other, how do we define who they are aimed at? Do we define by race, ethnicity, nationality, political party, sexual identity, religion even? When is that list more frightening than the work of unity is daunting? 
And how on earth are we to take action on our failure to live as if each of us is really beloved of God and each of them, whoever our them is? This poem by Amanda Gorman almost wasn't written because she found it hard to find the words to write poetry about horrific, unintelligible tragedy. Like many of us, she felt daunted and humbled at the prospect of being able to do anything to, per, to affect change. Our puny prayers, can they really be action? Her meager words, the handful of thoughts she posted before she could even imagine knitting them together as poetry were the beginning of her action. And she was putting them out there just in her pain to share. And soon moved deeply by seeing how much they moved other people. How much? A million dollars worth in three days. Raised for a group called Every Town for Gun Safety in three days. When it is dark, she says, she writes. And will keep doing so even when people tell her her poetry makes no difference against a gun. Well, we might think of our own ability or efforts, our prayers, small kindnesses, even our votes. We only get one. This is why Jesus prayed for both his disciples and those who would come because of their words and witness. It's why Jesus asked God so that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. And so may the prayers and hymns of our lips, the actions of our faith, and the presence of Christ be known through us and by us. And may it embrace us all as one. Amen. <laughs>